I designed 100 levels to reach the most advanced farm in the world, able to work entirely by itself. And this is exactly how I did it. So yeah, enjoy. Now we start off with the basic berry farm, which is pretty much just some relocated berry bushes fertilized with poop and poorly placed and aligned, producing about 5 to 15 berries every 5 days, depending on the type of berry bush you have. But this is only a level 1 farm, so of course it's a horrible design. And if you make this farm one more time after watching this video, I'm gonna be under your bed tonight. Now the first way to improve this farm is by increasing the number of berry bush. Digging up all the berry bushes in the world should gain us about 90 berry bushes in a normal sized world. However, we only really need 50, which will give us from 50 to 150 berries every 5 days. Next, we want to make sure we plant the berry bushes in the shape of a cube, leaving a 3x3 three three tile space in the middle and leaving spaces in between the rows of berry bushes. This will be very important later on. But if we want to make it as efficient as possible, we're going to have to get our hands a little bit dirty. Wait, no, Wilson, that's not what I meant. Now, by building a small pen in the middle of the 3x3 area, we can place a berry in the middle and turn this into a very simple gobbler farm. Since whenever we pick the berries, the turkeys will immediately go to the pen instead of running around eating all our berries. Yes, I'm talking about you. But we can still make this a whole lot better. Now, you're probably wondering, why make the area so big if all you're making is a small pen? Well, let me introduce you to the golden corrals. See, by placing an extra layer between the bushes and the bait, we can actually solve a huge problem about all berry farms and that's their inefficiency during winter see the difference between this farm and an average gobbler farm is giving us the ability to store the turkeys and not have to worry about them disappearing at the end of the day anyways this means pretty much having an unspoilable food any time of the year all at the cost of some row board and twigs and before you think about making the pens any bigger just know this is all for design because having the holding pens this small not only means we can put down the turkeys without even going into the pens but even when our pens seem like they're getting too full all we have to do is open and close the gates a couple times which will push the turkeys closer together fitting up to 37 turkeys just make sure you keep an eye out for the usda this might not be the most humane conditions anyways while a berry farm is good during autumn spring and can be upgraded to work during summer it really lacks on scalability and is very limited by its large cost of fertilizer over time and so to push our farming to the next level we're gonna need to look into adding a pig farm now just like the real world for every two law-abiding citizens whose life we destroy we can recruit one child to join our military and illegally explore their labor to sacrifice them for oil and territory oh wait sorry i got confused with the u.s military Bruh. for a second having a pig farm in the base will not only help with protection but by building a pen in the middle just like for the turkeys we can keep our pigs distracted out of their homes during a full moon when we can harvest their organs and get some great loot but there's actually an even better use for this and i know you what you're thinking isn't a full moon every 21 days how is this supposed to be any better than the berry farms when you can only harvest this once a season well first of all i'm inside your home and second of all there is a very simple way to take care of this with the help of some spiders. Now the easiest way to take care of this problem is by having a friend join our world as Weber and drop a spider then in the middle of the base. But for those of us who don't shower, using the loot from our pigs to craft a football helmet and a handbag, we can walk over to the nearest forest and take down a tier 3 spider den for the same nest. At this point, we can plant the spiders near the pigs to make them fight each other or by setting up some traps around the nest, we can catch them without even having to pick up a single weapon. Regardless of the tactic, we now have access to one of the best parts of this farm, giving us silk for equipment, spider glands for healing, and best of all, easy monster meat to force our own werepigs transformations. But the best part is only coming up. Using the silk from the spiders as well as gathering a couple seeds and reeds from the swamp, we can build a bird cage and trap to unlock one of the most versatile farms in the entire game. Not only will we be violating the third Geneva convention, but feeding them any type of meat at any stage of spoiling will return us one brand new fresh egg. Pretty much doubling the shelf life of all our food or even tripling it if we turn those eggs into a crockpot dish and then feed it back to them for another egg. Of course, this is not always convenient, but if that's not even enough for you, then maybe the fact that eggs make gold renew will change your mind. This is because although picking does not trade monster meat or frog legs for gold, which are the cheapest meat to get, they are more than happy to trade eggs for it. And with our traps and pigs farming tons of it every single day, we can kiss those boring old flint tools goodbye and keep working in our farm with style. Because there is one more thing eggs can do that no other farm can. We just need to add one last section to this farm. Now at this farm, we have four parts of this farm working amazingly together, but we're still a long way from that level 100 farm. Still, there's one more thing that will 
will get us a lot closer, and that's vegetables. Now, by crafting a garden thingamajig in a crafting tab and using some of those seeds from earlier, we can set up a small farm full of random seeds that have a small chance of turning into weeds or plants. And this is about as inefficient as this farm gets. But of course, we're the efficiency farmers, so we have to make this a whole lot better. The first step into a life of agriculture comes from saving the crops we want to grow more of, like potatoes and tomatoes, which provide a great amount of healing, and feeding them back to our feathery friend, which will turn those crops into seeds we can replant for that exact same crop again. With the seeds of our crops, we can now control which crops we grow and which ones we don't, and this will lead us straight to the next upgrade. Tending to crops is not too hard, since all we really need to do is get a seed back whenever we harvest it, so tending to them once as soon as we spawn them on the right season should do the job, until we get enough seeds to move into the final and most complicated stage. Crop combinations are where peak efficiency lies with this farm, since by combining certain crops that thrive off each other, like those same potatoes and tomatoes, we can get amazing results consistently, and if done long enough, can spawn a flying sausage we can burn to death and unlock a helper that will care for our crops 24-7. Still, after every single harvest, unless we're putting money into this game, we will have to retail the ground and plant every single seed by hand, eating up our precious time. So, although this is a great farm for reliable food, it doesn't quite fit our goal. But no need to worry, because I have an even better farm that not only produces vegetables faster, but requires absolutely no maintenance. Now, the fastest way to get bull kelp even on day one is by using a boat to push the kelp all the way to the shore and uprooting it to relocate it anywhere we want, where it will regrow fresh kelp every three days. However, this process does take a bit long, using only one boat that is, because using one raft to push all the kelp together and then placing another one right next to it, we can push an entire stack of kelp to the shore in less than a day. But even if this sounds like too much work, by exploring the entire edge of the map and finding two straight cuts of land branches facing the same way with no rocks or change of depth in between, we can find the Lunar Island, which will have plenty of kelp just laying on the ground. And once we have it in the shore near the farm, where we can push it all into one pile to not even have to walk to pick it up, we will not only have vegetables for crockpot recipes like pierogi, but we can also dry it out in just a quarter of a day for some great sanity. Overall, making it one of the best additions not only to this farm, but to any playthrough of the game. But we can still do plenty better. By heading back to the Lunar Island or just taking a shovel with us the first time we went there, we can dig up these stone fruit bushes. Stone fruit bushes, just like berry farms, will need to be refertilized whenever we place them down again. However, every four days, they will provide a stone fruit, which is basically astronaut food, because not only will it never spoil until it's mined, but it also has a chance to being a rock or a sapling. The saplings are really what we want here, since whenever those are replanted, they will need no refertilizing again, making this farm as efficient as possible and letting us just keep stockpiling all those cut stone for the final stage. And speaking of maintenance, it's time to focus on how to make ours a lot easier. Now, manure is the most straightforward way to fertilize our bushes throughout the seasons, but it's too much work. I mean, who has time to go down to the caves, pick light bulbs, make a were pig, feed it the light bulbs, kill the were pig, and then hold down spacebar for 10 minutes? Yeah, not me. So, how do we make this easier, you ask? Well, we don't. Instead, we switch over to a grass farm. Now, a grass farm is pretty straightforward. Either freezing and pushing already spawned grass geckos from the mosaic biome or picking grass until they spawn, we need to keep them inside a pen where placing a chester or another mob inside will harvest them continuously since their tails will keep regrowing all the time. And once we have a good amount of geckos making grass, we can put down some compost bins that will turn all this delicious grass into plant food for all our sad little bushes. And cutting down six steps to just two. Without even leaving the farm. So here we are, with our farm pretty much almost done, able to provide us healing, sanity, and enough hunger points to feed our entire family. The only real upgrade left to do is to improve the spider farm with bunny men from the caves, just the same way as pigs hammering two huts for each one we want to build. And then surrounding the spider den with the bunnies will make sure they are always kept at bay. The reason bunny men are a lot better than pigmen is because not only will they not eat the monster meat dropped from the spiders, but they will also come out at the same time of night as spiders, making them great at fighting each other. And on top of it all, bunny Pigmen will also respawn one day after dying instead of the four days it takes for pigmen to respawn, making the productivity of this farm a lot higher for bunnymen than pigs. But I think we've added enough big changes to this farm because it's time to finally automate it. So to finally automate this thing, we need to place down four lure plants between the farms on some wooden flooring to allow the eye plants to collect all the farms around them from the silk to the berries, the kelp drying on the racks, and even the stone fruit for a total of 15 inventory slots on each lure plant. Now you're probably wondering, why 
why would we need four lure plants when one could probably cover the entire thing? Well, it's pretty simple. Whenever a single lure plant is placed down, they can only make up to 27 eye plants. And when in a limited space like this one, the eyes will always try to find the widest open areas to spawn, which are usually not the ones we want them spawning in. So to make sure everything gets picked, the more lure plants we have, the more eyes spawn closer together and the bigger the area we can harvest as well. The pig farm works as protection for the farm, making sure nothing kills the turkeys or the geckos and the compost farm has to stay out of the range so all the geckos won't get killed by the eye plants. There is one problem though. Lure plants will digest our food if we leave it inside them too long, about one item every 20 seconds. So this farm is very time sensitive, meaning the best order to do everything is fertilize the berry bushes and plant the kelp on day one, day three plant the lure plants in stone fruit bushes, drying the kelp late on day four and not worrying too much about the spiders for the grand results of more food than you can possibly eat. Or at least that's what you would think. See, there is something I'm not telling you. And that's that there is an even easier way of doing this. But this final stage comes with the difference of having to harvest a couple of grass and picking some kelp into doing absolutely nothing but eating. So after farming the ancient guardian, covering the entire farm in an unpenetrable wall made from all the stone fruit we gathered, farming deer clubs and placing down a couple houndia shootias, we just need one last thing. So there it is, the most efficient, automatic, self-sustaining farm ever invented, producing over a thousand points of hunger every five days, and it's all ran by Maxwell Mays. Oh, the houndiest shooters are just to make sure they don't try anything. But hey, watch this next video if you want to see an even crazier build.